Okay, this was supposed to be a video on uh, me using the shepherd stove, getting used to it, testing its operation, testing things like how quick it comes to comes to temperature, etc., and so forth. Uh, I was going to replicate the uh, timeline that would normally be associated with going to a weekend. Uh, camping or living history event whereby I show up on late on a Friday evening, set up the stove, get it up to cooking, maybe bake some biscuits or something for Saturday morning breakfast, and wake up Saturday morning and fill it back up full of wood to make some more coals, do some more baking. But at six o'clock on the morning on Friday, yesterday, uh, got a knock on the door as a gentleman saying that he was here to put a roof on the house. Uh, I live in a rental community. Everybody in this cul-de-sac has got the same landlord. And it was my turn to have my house re-roofed. So this is what my doorway looked like when I left for work this morning. Now when I got home, the guy was putting his stuff up in the trailer, uh, and said that he would have to come back tomorrow, today, Saturday, uh, and finish up roofing the back of the house. Well, that meant that I wasn't going to be able to use my backyard, and I wasn't going to be able to test my stove. But that might have been a good thing, because as I was scrolling the internet and looking at some posts on the traditional Camp Crafters Guild, uh, a guy named Mike Ross came up with some information that caused me, that gave me the beginning, the path of finding out the identity of that stove. Okay, so uh, when I opened up the homepage at Traditional Camp Crafters Guild, I uh, saw there was a post in response to one that I had made and it was by a guy named Mike Ross. And Mike is a guy who follows one of the Ten Commandments of uh, living history. He owns paper books. He reads paper books. It wasn't something I thought of, and he wasn't actually researching my stove. But he came across this information uh, while looking for something else, which is very often the case of what we're doing here. And he came across a book that showed this picture that looks remarkably like my stove. And it was accompanied by a paragraph that describes it. Let me put on my cheaters and look over here at the screen and read it to you. Okay, so he says, the most famous as well as one of the better stoves for tents and other small shelters is the sheep herder stove of the West. It's a rather large article of the box type with sufficient capacity for cooking a meal for five or six campers. It is about 27 inches long, a foot high and wide, and has a rapidly heating oven of five by eight by 11 inches. It weighs 27 pounds. A stove of sheet iron or sheet steel will burn out in time, but the sheep herder has the reputation of lasting longer than any other stove made of such materials. The one used on my last winter trip had been providing almost continuous service for four years. I only, the only place I know of where you can get a sheep herder stove is the Smiley Company, 536 Mission Street, San Francisco, California, 5. Well, there you go. Again, a paper book 
has given us the fuel we need to use the internet as the engine for our search. Now, uh, while I'm being incredibly giddy that I have a description of a stove that Townsend Whelan owned, well, I've got to research the company and see if I can determine the vintage of the stove and whether or not the stove I have is the exact one that Whelan is talking about in his book. Did I forget to mention the book? On Your Own in the Wilderness by Townsend Whelan, Colonel Townsend Whelan, and Bradford Ann Gere. That book was copywritten in 1958. Now, Whelan has been writing in the outdoor uh, sphere, the outdoor genre, since the uh, late 1920s. So, uh, we don't know whether or not his comments uh, were uh, reminiscent of that time, or it was pulled from an article, or if it was something that uh, he wrote in 1958, having just discovered that stove. Are you with me? Because he could have known about that stove for 30 years. Now, Mike Ross comes across again with another paper book that has another illustration of that stove, and that is the complete book of Camping by Miracle and Decker, and this is the picture. Now, that book was copywritten in 1972, so we know that the uh, stove was still in production by 1972, okay? And then we find a third book, yeah, third book, uh, called Alaskan Adventure by J.P. Williams, copywritten in 1952, which has a foreword by Townsend Wheeland. Again, Townsend Wheeland's name is mentioned in conjunction with my stove. We're going to go on a journey of discovery uh, using these photographs. Uh, if we've done this before on the channel last year sometime, when we tried to determine what kind of canteen that Earl Schaefer used on his first through hike of the Appalachian Trail. One of my uh, viewers asked that because it's not mentioned in any of the gear lists that list Earl Schaefer's gear. So we're going to use some of those techniques to see about if we can determine whether or not this stove is the same one Townsend Whelan talks about and when it might have been made. Okay, let's get to it. Okay, here's the picture in Whelan's book. Let's take a look. Uh, what we're looking for first is points of similarity and points of dissimilarity, okay? Where, where it's the same and where it's different, okay? Here are the points of similarity. First off, there's a damper on the door and we can see the door latch. Now, that's the door to the oven, okay? And... It is a near perfect match for the door and latch on my stove. The next point is this little handle here at the end. That is the handle for the damper. Okay, pull it back to close the damper and hold more heat in the oven. Push it forward, opens the damper, and allows more heat to escape up the chimney. This handle here is the same as the one on my stove. The next point is the connection of the latch to the oven door. And this picture very prominently shows three dots, which are rivets holding that stove, holding that latch to the stove. And we have the hinge, there's a plate that is kind of tack welded to that stove uh, that, that holds the hinge to the door of the stove. And take a look at mine, and you can see that it's pretty much the same. 
Now, the photograph that, that was in the, the complete camping book uh, isn't as, it doesn't have as high a quality, but it does show the latch and the damper opening on my stove. Okay, so we have a number of points of similarity. Okay, it appears that the stove I have, and this is what we can determine for sure, we, 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 we can't engage in wishful thinking at this point. Uh, the hardware and the easily visible methods of construction of the stove that the Smiley Company stove that Whelan talks about and my stove appear to be the same, okay? Now, this could mean that uh, there were two stove manufacturers who bought their hardware from the same contractor, okay? That's a possibility. Although, Whelan says there's only one company he knows of. So, we're getting a little close. Now, let us talk about the points of dissimilarity, okay, where they are not the same. And while we're looking at that picture uh, of, of the stove, the, uh, the, the opening, the, the <laughs> let me recalibrate my lips here, the oven door, we can also look above and we can see that there is a circular plate on top and it appears to be sitting over an opening. This is most likely what is known as a as a stove eye. Uh, you, you've seen them on ranges everywhere, you know, old wood stoves. You can pick up the plate, you can stuff wood directly down or, or coals directly down underneath that. You can leave it off and set a pot on top so that the, the bottom of the pot is exposed directly to the flame or you can use it as a method of uh, regulating the temperature in the stove. In other words, you pull that off, heat goes right up that hole before it goes down the, down the line to the oven, okay? Now, if we look at uh, Whelan's illustration, that same thing is there. It, it's just it's not as as uh, apparent that it is covering a hole okay it, it could be something that is merely laying on top maybe it's a cover for the for the chimney okay so how can we explain the uh, difference between my stove which does not have a stove eye on top, okay? What my stove has is a series of reinforcing bars underneath. They don't appear to be homemade, doesn't appear to be a repair, okay? The surface of my stove is warped through heat. This is to be expected from light gauge steel. Uh, and it appears that these bars were factory installed in order to limit that and at least keep the top of the stove flat enough to put pots and pans on. Okay, now, how do we explain that? Well, we go back to Whelan's description, and the part I didn't read before is the most important as far as this goes. It says, these large camp outfitters also have a smaller and lighter stove. 20 by 12 by 12 inches, including a small oven. This weighs only a dozen pounds. Less expensive. It is adequate for two or three campers. It does not have the longevity of the sheep herder, however. Both varieties come with telescoping pipe. Okay, so here we have a possible explanation. Okay, so there you go. We have got a stove that uses the same hardware and the same method of construction for the doors and the same 
telescoping pipe for the stove pipe. But one is smaller than the other. And Whelan says that the Smiley Company is the only company he knows of that makes a stove like this. And they make a smaller stove. So I believe I can say with about 90% certainty that the stove I have is a stove made by the Smiley Company in San Francisco sometime after 1958. Okay, the book Alaska Invention uh, Adventures only mentions that company, but doesn't give any illustrations, doesn't give any uh, narrative, and it's mentioned in the big bibliography but it doesn't give us a footnote so that we can know what context it was in, okay? He just bought something from the Smiley Company. Now, in the 1970s, we know that the Smiley Company was also making camping cookware. So he could have been talking about that. The cookware that Smiley was making at the time, uh, they made something that I'd really love to have. Uh, they made a cook set specifically for the Svea 123. Here's what it looks like. The 123 and its cup fits inside a small pot, which then fits inside a larger pot, which then has a stuff sack. So you got a three-piece cook set. This is a wonderful thing. It would, I would use it. It would go well with my 123. But Where we're going with this now is the reason why I'm happy that we have determined that this is a stove that was made in the last third of the 20th century during my lifetime. Okay. When I first got wind that Pounds and Whelan had written about the stove from the Smiley Company and if that was the only company they made, I thought perhaps it was he was making reference to something that he knew in the 1920s and the 1930s. And I wasn't going to use it because it would have been a hundred-year-old artifact with the name of a very famous individual attached to it, okay? Now, it still has the name of a very uh, famous individual attached to it, I believe it probably has enough life left in it that I can use it, okay? It's possibly 70 to 50 years old, okay? Which doesn't make it an antique, and it doesn't mean that I'm going to be destroying something really, really, really valuable. I bought this without knowing the manufacturer. I bought it because it looked nice. It looked like it comes from the 1920s and the 1930s, and I could use it in a classic slash traditional slash historic camping context, and it wouldn't be too far out of place. I'm still going to do that. Sean, we're going to have biscuits. Okay, I'm still going to be baking at the squirrel camp. James Bender, the bake-off is still in effect. I still challenge you to bake. I will use my smiley oven and you will use your reflector oven and we see who likes the biscuits the best. Okay? We'll have a video of that when it occurs. It'll be out sometime in November. In the meantime, I'm going to be putting together that stove test for next weekend. That video will be out. Got a couple more I'm playing around with. And, oh, uh, if you are so inclined, I have started a Facebook page called Vico Vining Company. Vico Expedition Outfitters on Facebook. Uh, it's it, uh, the Make Your Own Gear stuff that I show here. I will put that up on uh, Vico Expedition Outfitters if you want to buy it. Okay, I'm making gear now where uh, of stuff I don't need so that I can show you guys how to make it. Okay, so if you see it in the video, uh, it might show up at Vico uh, Outfitters uh, 
in a couple of weeks. There's also a bunch of junk on there, okay? Stuff I find uh, when I go through my closets and, and stuff like things I didn't even know I still had, okay? That stuff will go up there. So some of it's collectible, a good much of it is reproduction. If you want to get into this classic camping thing and want to have some small camp items to use so that you're not destroying artifacts, take a look. Uh, when I sell something, I, I take the post down. If, if there's a picture of it on that, uh, on Vico Expedition Outfitters, I'll have a link in the comment section. It's still for sale, okay? Alrighty, we'll see you down the trail.